Fiona's 2011-12 voyage was a good deal less exciting than my trip through the Northwest Passage. This time I elected to do a fairly leisurely clockwise sail along the rim of the Atlantic, starting off with Canada, going to Iceland, the Faroes, Scotland, Ireland, down to Portugal, across the Atlantic to Brazil, along the north coast of South America, to the Caribbean, and a very pleasant sail, six weeks long, through the Caribbean, back to Bermuda and New York. My intent was to visit a few islands on the way that could only be got to by sail. We visited Sable Island off Canada. Uh, we went to Hibene in Iceland. We went to um, uh, St. Peter and Paul Rock in the middle of the Atlantic. We sailed to Devil Islands off French Guiana and then to the Caribbean where we had a pleasant sail through all the islands up to Puerto Rico and then from there to Bermuda and home. So that's how I spent roughly 10 months and 12,500 nautical miles. As James Fitzpatrick would say in the old MGM travel talks, as the sun sets in the west we say goodbye to the exotic Atlantic islands and I suggest that you pour yourself a Fiona cocktail, some Mount Gay rum and apple juice with a slice of lemon. Enjoy the video. Fiona left Long Island in mid-July 2011 and sailed through the Cape Cod Canal to Lundenburg in Nova Scotia, to Sable Island and to St. John's in Newfoundland. From there we made a fairly rough passage to Reykjavik in Iceland. We moved along the coast to Hemene Island and then sailed to the Faroes and down to the Hebrides in northern Scotland. From Oban, where we spent two weeks, we sailed to Dingle in Ireland, crossed over to three ports in Portugal and then sailed to Madeira, to the Canaries and down the African coast to the Cape Verde Islands. We crossed the Atlantic and stopped at St. Peter and Paul Rock, sailed to Fernando de Noronha, moved along the north coast of South America to Fortaleza and to French Guiana where we spent a few days at Devil Island. We moved to the uh, Caribbean, spent a few weeks looking at the Leeward and Windward Islands and then sailed directly to Bermuda and home. We arrived in late April 2012, 12,515 miles. <laughs> I left Long Island with a crew of three, Wayne, Ryan and Sue. Oh, we're just finishing our traditional walk to the southeast light. Sue is going to walk down to the beach and back, which is a long way. The Oa Bar at Block Island. This is Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. There's some really nice Victorian architecture here. And I'm going to walk over to the Academy, which is famous for its rather bizarre architecture. We're going to have a look at the Academy in Lunenburg. Used as the sets for many horror films, actually. Set near an old cemetery. And uh, this afternoon, in a couple of hours, we'll leave for Sable Island. I guess the first of our small islands that we want to visit this cruise. This is the Charter Square Rigger, the Picton Castle, normally based in Lunenburg. But we met her when we were leaving Bermuda at the end of the cruise. This is Wayne and Ryan blowing up the dinghy as we lie anchored off Sable Island. We motored over to the beach and met Zoe, a botanist that gave us a wonderful tour of the western end of the island. So there they are, the wild horses of Sable Island. Here's something left over from World War II. An old Bren gun carrier. I've not seen one of these for years and years. 
the grey seals were fascinated by us when we got to the south side of the island. Here's a young foal with its mother. Coming in to St John's, Newfoundland. This is a rather typical Newfoundland day in St John's. Here are statues of the famous Newfoundland dogs. Low fog lying on the hills. And here are the boats. There are about five boats tied up here. St John's Newfoundland, there's Fiona there. A couple more boats tied up. And we have a lunchtime concert. During the last week of the leg to Reykjavik, we encountered fairly heavy weather. This is the building uh, next to the marina. This is one of the reasons why Iceland went bankrupt. It cost billions, well, billions of uh, krona. Fiona lies just north of the very impressive glass building called Harper. Only in Iceland can we get the tourists to go swimming on a cold, rainy day, which is what this is. This is the famous Blue Lagoon. Are we crazy or what? This is my new crew, Mark and Arlene, with my Icelandic friend, Ellie. It's pouring rain. It feels kind of nice. Oi, oi, oi. Ellie was nice enough to drive us in his SUV to some of the scenic spots on the southwest coast of Iceland. This is the rift in uh, central Iceland in which the Atlantic plate on the left is moving away from the European plate here on the right. This is another view of the rift. In Viking times, this was the site of Parliament where weapons had to be laid aside for meetings. I am straddling the Atlantic and European plates. Each year the plates move and the rift gets wider and wider. We're in geyser country. The old geyser visits the geyser. We're expecting this to erupt. Wow. This is the spectacular Goldfoss waterfall, which is fed by melting glaciers. So, here we are at uh, Kerith in Icelandic. Ker means uh, a bowl in English. And uh, so Kerith, it's the bowl. And there's fish in the bottom. You know, tiny fish. And this island we're just approaching is Surtsey. It appeared in the 1960s, I think 63, as a result of a volcanic eruption. And although it's a small island I'd like to visit, you are not allowed to actually land there because biologists want to study how flowers and insects have established themselves in a brand new bit of land. So another shot of Surtsey in the morning sun. Here comes the ferry into the Vesman Islands, Hibane. And this is the volcano that blew up and added 
few square miles to the east end of the island in 73. We'll try and get up there. And this is a Norwegian boat that's sailing to the Faroes tonight, I think, and we are going tomorrow. It's a little fishing port, this, with the ferry joining it to the mainland of Iceland. This is the pump that's memorial to the to the way they cooled the lava on one side so that it didn't invade the harbour, which is over there, and you can see that the lava came down and buried the entrance. And this is Sventon, who just drove me up here in his truck and uh, is the harbour master, the director of the harbour. And this is the pump, this is actually a US Army pump that was used to pump seawater to cool the uh, to cool the lava. This is the summit of Eldfell, the volcano that tried to eat Heme. Here you see people on the path up. Here comes the ship heading for the pass. The narrow part is right there where that brown is. That shows how far the lava got. It's quite narrow. We are running down from Iceland to the Faroes. We've had stern winds nearly all the time. And uh, we've let George take care of the wheel there. And we've been wing and wing for a couple of days. As we arrived at the Faroes, we were opposed by stiff tidal currents. This is the village of Shushkova on Straymoy Island in the Faroes. That wooden, that uh, stone post there is all that remains of a, a church that was built about a thousand years ago. And most of this was land. But then there was a tsunami, you can see a bit of the island there, and all of this was washed away, including the church. Here's our van that brought us here from uh, Torshaven. Here in the Faroes, the, the common practice is to grow sod on the roof. I guess it's good insulation. And here on the left is the church they built to replace the one that got washed away. This house is 900 years old, according to the guide and has been occupied by the same family for 18 generations. So you think about that. The generations typically 30 years, probably longer here. And so that's 600 years of family occupancy. There goes our guide, and here goes the van. And they just pulled up this uh, hay. <laughs> by hitching a block on the back of this truck and they're going to bring up all the others as well he's tying a knot on the, on the bike there this is getting the winter feed the hard way so off, off the other one goes man. <laughs> Here we have uh, the stables from, for the cows. They have been very small at that time. And that was for, for the hay, do you have that? And the other part was for the people. And they have open fire there. And then sleep in small boxes, 150 centimeter long. and. and very often two in each box and they was not laying down because they was afraid if they was falling asleep and, and they will not wake up again if they was laying. <laughs> the busy scene in Torshaven, there you can see a cruise ship towering above the rest. The waterfront here, very Scandinavian looking. Characteristic church here. Whoops. While we were in Torshaven, the circus came to town and we found time to visit it.
From Iceland, we sailed to northern Scotland. Here we are entering the Minch, which is Gaelic for the mouth. Uh, we unfortunately countered headwinds, which meant we went to tack down the Minch, sometimes at night. It wasn't very popular with the crew. But eventually we weathered the Cape there on Skye and got a lift to Rum Island. Our anchor chain was stuck and we had to just uh, move on to Tobermory and on Mull Island. We sailed down the Mull Sound to Oban where I stayed for a couple of weeks. Changed crew and we double-handed from there to Ireland. This could easily be our best day of Ireland sailing. We're in the Hebrides. The head there is Mull. And uh, on our left there is part of the sky. And behind us, you can see uh, egg, muck, uh, Harris over there. We just sailed from rum and we're going to Mull for the day. Victor is steering the boat there. the waterfront at Oban at low tide. A little ferry for the uh, marina across the strait there goes from that dock there that, where that ramp is. Very typical Scottish building with all the chimneys here. Here you see a genuine bit of Highland cattle and in the distance the Firth of Lawn and Mull. This is on the island of Carrera which is a few miles from, well a mile actually no more from Oban where the boat is. I don't think this guy wants me to pass him. Right. Rather aggressive feeder, this little chappy. Keeps butting his mother to move over. Here's an unusual creature a ram with four horns. Come on, show me the other horn. There we go. It's not a unicorn, it's a quadricorn. This is quite a historic anchor fetched up here at uh, Oban Marina. It belonged to a tugboat that was sent by Lady Franklin to assist in the search for her husband, Sir John Franklin, in the 1850s. Goodness knows what caused that fluke to bend right down and break. Look at the crown there, it looks like a giant iceberg sat on it. This is a local landmark at Oban called McCaig's Tower. It was built at the start of the 20th century by a wealthy man who was trying to keep masons employed. He built it in winter when there's no work. And I think it took several years to put together. Overlooks the harbour. We'll take a look from the top. And here overlooking the harbour, I think it's a nice view. In the distance is the Firth of Lawn and the island of Mull. During World War II, this harbour was a very busy military base. The RAF operated flying boats, the Navy had frigates and destroyers, and the Americans had an air base here as well. Here's a shot of McKeague Tower from the waterfront. Uh, northwest coast of Ireland, just in the distance there, 
It's a Tory island, a small island a few miles off the coast. And the wind has been against us for several days. And yesterday the mainsail tore when we tried to reef it. So we we can only use the number two reef, which is a really small sail. We're gonna change it. There it is. The corner here shows you that's what's left of the left. The leech, I'm sorry, that's what left of the leech. So we're going to have to get that repaired or repaired ourselves and we can get to pause or somewhere. But in the meanwhile, we can't use this sail beyond that reef there. It's just a bit small for sailing. So we're going to change it to the regular main. Here's the mainsail coming through the companionway, the storm main. So we have to get this folded up. And then the full main put on. So that's step two. Okay, we bent on a fresh mainsail, reefed it, and made a few hours of westing. But then the wind increased, conditions deteriorated, and we had to hold to for nearly a day. This is the approach to Dingle, an island after a somewhat rough passage from Oban, Scotland. This took us a week. Uh, let's see what Connor has to say. Connor, you, at times you never thought you'd be seeing Dingle again. What do you say for that? Delighted. Good to be back. <laughs> Hi, we're in Anaskol, County Kerry, uh, on a unique day. Um, Eric is going to visit Tom Crean's pub, the South Pole, and uh, we have a market fair, a horse fair here today as well. And as you can see, it's uh, quite unique. Hey, do you want to call you? Yeah, come on. How much? Smile. 200 only. 200? I'll give you 50 euros. Stop. We're at Tom Crean's pub in Anniscoe, the, uh, the South Pole Inn. Tom Crean trekked with Shackleton and tried to get to South Pole and didn't make it. But he always wanted a beer at the South Pole. So when he left the Navy, he opened this pub in Anna School uh, and called it the South Pole, so we could always have a beer whenever we wanted at the South Pole. And there it is, the famous pub, Tom Crean, was a central uh, figure in Shackleton's expedition, a pillar of strength, actually. In Dingle, there are dozens of great Irish pubs with the traditional music. <laughs> Leaving Dingle, Connor was replaced by Ina and Drake. This is where Bill and I used to have coffee every day. When we were in Vienna de Costello. These wonderful carvings look familiar. In Vienna do Costello, we took the funicular railway to the top of the mountain. The funicular balances the weight of the train going up against the weight of the train going down. At the top of the uh, railway lies a very spectacular basilica. And there's the basilica, pretty impressive. Here's a shot of the harbour entrance of Vienna, the Castello. The marina's down there, but you can't really see it. That tall building and just to the uh, right of the bridge. See any dolphins? <laughs> On the way to Nazare, Drake got some wonderful shots of dolphins.
Oh, he hit the box day! <laughs> oh, poor guy! He must have been like, out! <laughs> On the way south we made an intermediate stop at Nazaré on the Portuguese coast, uh, a typical seaside resort actually. This is uh, a, a small fishing boat and um, fishing is also a major industry here and you can see some of the ladies selling dried fish on the beach. And here are the fish drying racks. All these things here are fish being dried. And down here, there's some ladies selling them. Atlantic rollers pounding the beach here at Nazare. And Drake walked down to take some shots. Before we left Nazare, the engine started quit and it was repaired by local mechanics who were very competent. Okay, this is the Royal Palace at Sintra with Drake in the foreground. And what we're trying to do now is have some lunch. This is inside the National Palace at uh, Sintra, which I believe was the summer residence of the king in the 15th to 17th century. Pretty sexy ceiling. These are the kitchens of the amazing chimneys here. Go all the way up there. And you get very peculiar sound. Boop. Boop. This is the marina at Cascades. You can see part of it there. The River Tagus beyond. The great walls of the fort built years ago overlook it. And next to the fort is King Carlos I, who was a sailor. And then in the distance to the north is the village or town of Cascais. Typical Portuguese patterns on the, on the square here. There's an Irish pub, and we'll go down here. It leads to a neat little square. Noon, except it's a bit fast. Here's a restaurants here. There's a British pub there. And maybe we'll buy a. Herald Tribune. We are arriving at the island of Porto Santo. 
part of the Madeira group. In fact, very faintly in the back there you can see Madeira itself right in the centre of the screen just by the bow of the boat. And we'll go around this small island there, that one, and enter the town. I flew to New York from Cascais for a couple of weeks and on return I picked up Marcus, a German classical musician, to replace Ina and Drake. This is the marina at uh, Porto Santo, about 40 miles from Funchal. And you can see that its claim to fame is this wonderful beach. Unfortunately it means it's a long walk into town. Marcus is going to try fishing. Back there is... Porto Santos, Santo, and here is Madeira. So we'll see if he catches anything. There seems to be plenty of fish around. And that is, we saw fishermen back there in Porto Santo. Tons of fish. This is an interesting sailboat. I guess it's a bark with one mass of square sails. And it uh, belongs to an organisation that believes they can make money freighting on the sail. <laughs> I don't know if they ever made any money, but it's very romantic. I don't know how well this shot will come out, but it might give some idea of what Funchal looks like. Basically, a city built on a series of hills. You can see the, the street lights going up into the hills. And the bright lights here are the marina, which is where the boat is. And apparently this area was very popular with Winston Churchill in his older days when he came here to paint. These are the highest sea cliffs in Europe here. 1900 feet above sea level. We've certainly got some spectacular valleys in this part of the world. Our tour took us to the north coast of Madeira, which looked rough enough. <laughs> Definitely want to keep Fiona away from there. I'm going to take the Teleferico up to the mountain in one of these things. We're on the Teleferico, heading up to the mountain. Le Monte in Portuguese and there just to, uh, just to the right of that cruise ship is the marina where Fiona lies so this is the view from the Teleferico these are the wicker sleds that gullible tourists get whistled down the mountain in but uh, it's very quiet today There's almost nobody on the Teleferico so I don't know if there's any activity in this department if there is I'll try and get a video Nobody was risking their necks on those wicker sleds when I was there. So this is what it looked like in the year 2000 on a previous cruise to Madeira. We are arriving in Spain. My Gomorrah to be precise, there it is. And there on our left is Tenerife with the famous El Tide. 12,000 foot volcano, though I don't think it's active. It was once. So we've seen it all, usually covered in cloud. This is a Christmas concert in San Sebastian at Lagamora Island. This is the old church of San Sebastian in Lagomora Island. It's uh, pretty old, built in 1758. And Christopher Columbus used to live in this town. So we'll go and take a look at his house and one or two other contemporaries. This is allegedly where Christopher Columbus lived. Hard to tell. It's really true, because we're talking about 
1490s or something. But, uh, this looks like an old street with the modern development behind. And no doubt in due course it will all get knocked down. Well, this one certainly looks old. But more accurately, I should say it's showing its age. We are running down to the Cape Verde. See a wink and wink. We'll try and get some pictures of the swells. This is Jordan, who joined the boat in uh, Lagomora. We'll try and get a nice swell. There's one we don't want there. Well, died away. Mark Cole, our new crew, is contemplating our arrival at San Vicente in the Cape Verdes. And here it is, early morning. The sun isn't quite up yet. It should be coming up over there fairly soon. We've even got a little room there. This is uh, Mindelo opening up here. Uh, the bay is called Porto Grande. And the town of Mindelo is right there. And what's interesting is that the oil industry has come to San Vicente. Here, on our starboard, is an oil rig. This is the marina that's been built at uh, Mindelo since I was last here. Uh, you can see Fiona there, the bow's bit sticking out. Quite extensive marina, as you can see. We've got a little floating bar here. And uh, beyond is the town of Mindelo, which itself is not too greatly changed, except they built, I think they built this pier here since I was here last. And there's the little replica. Balaam. This is the city fruit market, fruit and veg, in Mandela. It seems to be typical of Africa, these ladies that sell just a few cent items. Christmas Day heading for St. Peter and Paul Rock. Typical uh, Christmas day on the boat with our old fashioned Christmas tree. We have on board Damien there on the left and Mar Marco on the right. And we're having oysters as a snack. Unfortunately, the Mount Gay is holding up so we can be fairly cheerful this Christmas. Cheers. Cheers. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Ah, the weight. The weighing things. Your luggage. Ah, right. <laughs> or fish. Or fish, exactly. Yes, That's exactly. Okay. Yeah, Marco still hopes to catch a whale. Yeah. Or a, a shark. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Peter and Paul Rock. Unfortunately, as we approached, the squall came on us. As you can see, it's very grey. We're about half a mile away. And this is 55 miles north of the equator and about 500 miles from Brazil. Funnily enough, there's also another boat here. As we approached this boat, we found that it was occupied by Brazilian scientists. We talked to them on the radio. Unfortunately, the weather was too rough, or at least the surf was too rough, for us to launch a dinghy and go ashore ourselves, which was rather a disappointment. But at least we got close to Peter and Paul Rock. Oh, 
not, we're not going to go ashore in the dinghy, I'm afraid. Well, it's getting close to happy hour, and yesterday we crossed the equator, and we have a couple of pollywogs here, who are eagerly awaiting the arrival of Father Neptune to certify they're no longer pollywogs, but sons of Neptune. Welcome. Father Neptune is coming. Oh la la. Aha! Hey, you've got some polywogs on board, eh? You and you look like greenhorns to me. That's Father Neptune. That's Damien. And the traditions in the sea, Frozen right? Yeah. Damien. <laughs> this is a tradition of the owner cocktail. Okay, rum. Some juice. Apple juice. Damien Legault. I don't pronounce you a son of Neptune. <laughs> Thank you. And Marco Lowe. You know, a son of Neptune. Thank you very much. Hey, hey, hey. Fernando de Noronha. An anchor you've been at many times. Came in last night, pretty crowded. But the big change is this. Cruise ships. Fernando de Noronha. Well, we're saying goodbye to Fernando de Noronha basically chased away by greedy bureaucrats who were charging us a huge fee for anchoring here. It was uh, $22 a night per person and uh, $89 for the boat. So we're looking at uh, $60, $140 a night to just anchor out. Seems a bit ridiculous. So, and also we, we had to leave by 8 o'clock so it's about 7 20 now. The sun is going to rise any minute. And we'll say goodbye to this famous peak here. The phallic symbol of Fernando de Noronha. Anyway, here are the puffy white flowers. This is what I'm going to do, right? Is put some zincs on the boat. Why? How come we're getting a torrential storm? Goodbye, Eric. Yeah, the water's... I just can't, literally can't see it. Okay. This is the marina at Fortaleza, at the Marina Park Hotel, such as it is. It's, it's really just a collection of floats that you can tie up to stern two. As you can see, there's Fiona. And if you look carefully, there's the gangplank sticking out because the surge here is terrible. And we have to put in a plank to, uh, to get ashore there. However, it's convenient for the swimming pool and all the gorgeous Brazilian beauties that are here. And also the showers, we've had showers every day. This is the central market in Fortaleza. Near a very nice church which lights up at different colours, with different colours at night. And we'll have a look inside, the architecture inside here is pretty spectacular. This is inside the central market. This is a 
our approach to Devil's Island. Another oh, rough day, 20 knot winds. See, it's there's Marco steering the boat. In the early 19th century, the French established prisons throughout French Guiana based on British experience at Botany Bay in Australia. One of the worst was on Royal Island there in the centre, the main island of the Devil's Island group. To the right is St Joseph's, which was used for very hard cases in solitary, and to the upper left is Devil Island itself, which was used for special cases such as Captain Dreyfus. This is uh, Royal Island, it's the main island of the, of the so-called Devil's Island, which consists of three islands really, this one, Royal, and then through there, St Joseph's, and Ile Diable you can't see at the moment, it's behind, St, uh, behind actually Royal. This was the main administrative centre, this is where the warehouses were, the commandant's office and things like that, so we'll uh, We'll go ashore later on and do a tour of the buildings whenever it's appropriate. Yeah. Ile de Salou, which is the penal colony, which includes Devil's Island. This is actually called Royal Island. You can see all the ramparts, presumably built by convict labour. And you can see the jungle's quite thick and luxuriant. <coughs> Here's Marco. We got pretty wet coming across in the dinghy. Yeah, everything went well. At least it got us here. Yeah. It just has to get us back. <laughs> there we're looking straight at Devil's Island. It's the one to the north of Royal. And in the days when it was a penal colony, they had a wire connecting the two so that supplies could be ferried across without braving all these heavy seas, which of course make it very difficult to land, but I don't think there's a single landing spot. So whether you can actually get ashore at Devil's Island, not only knows, I don't think so. But that's Devil's Island, viewed from Royal Island. Devil's Island here is connected by a, a cable car in the days of a penal colony, and we think that we found the buttress for the cable there. Here's Marco feeding the wildlife. <laughs> yeah. have to find out their proper name. And this building is actually the military hospital. Apparently it was even used by people from the mainland because the climate here on Ile de Salou was better than the mainland so people that were sick were sent here. <sighs> Malaria, lung diseases were common. Most of the, of course this was not used by the inmates much as the wardens and the high officials on land and uh, the inmates uh, died, it was called uh, the dry guillotine, if they died of an illness. <laughs> Marco the Explorer in the military hospital. It's like a squad. Okay Polly, what do you say? And then somewhere we've got some peacocks. Are you going to open your feathers for us, eh? We think this is what's left of cells, it's just the bottoms of the windows there and you can see that they're quite small. Yeah, you can just see a window there, it's not been destroyed. This is where condemned prisoners were housed, prisoners sentenced to death for a capital crime and they were in these cells here and according to the blurb at the bar 
to set up the guillotine right here. In the morning of the execution when the final uh, order came through. On Devil Islands, the punishment for many infractions was death by the guillotine. Here is a painting by a convict showing an inmate about to meet this ultimate fate. Marco is uh, going to check out the, the Papillon story to see if throwing coconuts in was a drift off to sea or not. Okay, Marco's going to try again, see if the coconut. Throw it, throw it a long way out. Well, it's not coming back in shore, that one. In fact, there's two of them there now the basis of a raft. Here's the old cemetery on St. Joseph's Island. Of course this was just for warders and officials. The prisoners got buried out there in the sea. We'll have to come down and see if we can read a few gravestones. Yeah you are a happy little lizard aren't you? This is my last shot of Devil's Island um, from Royal Island and in, nowadays it's not permitted to land on Devil's Island and in fact it wasn't used that much it was for example when Dreyfus was on it he was in solitary confinement by himself on this island. Mark and I sailed double-handed from the Devil's Island group to Barbados in the West Indies. We experienced fairly brisk trade when sailing and the leg took us a week. We got the sails repaired in Barbados and then headed south to Tobago where there's a tropical rainforest and we changed crew. I got two Americans, Louise and Robert, to sail up through the Wynwood and Leeward Islands as far as Puerto Rico. From Puerto Rico we sailed north to Bermuda with again a new crew, Peg and George. This is a shot of downtown Bridgetown in Barbados. It's one of the most attractive uh, cities in the West Indies. I'm at the British Military Cemetery in uh, Barbados and we've come to say our usual hello to Susanna, my great-grandmother. This is Susanna's grave, number 58. She's been here a long time, she died in 1880. The wife of Colour Sergeant Major John Gilmore Forsyth. The writing's very hard to read. She was 37 when she died. This is the Mount Gay Rum Distillery. And uh, we just did the tour. And they're going to give us a drink in this bar, I think. They give you Monty is extra special, right? So if you want to try it, I'm sure that Ryan will be able to help you out with that. But again, thanks again for touring. That's it for me, okay? Here's the crew, Louise and Robert. Intrepid jungle explorers dodging all the headhunters and the guys with the poison arrows. Our guide is going to demonstrate how Tarzan swung from vine to vine in the jungle. Thank you. Oh, this is the vine. Yeah. As you know, this I, I cut it. I come from the back. I know. <laughs> See, these are roots that grow yes. from the top of trees down. Here we go. <laughs> this is your best part, this fit, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Harris has found a termite nest. And he tells us that early explorers who were starving to Look, death she's coming up. She's coming up eat there the now. termites. 
So we're just demonstrating that. Yeah. Right, right, putting then. your finger on a hole and the ants walk out the turn. Keep your finger there. Keep your finger there. There you go. Leave it, leave it, leave it. Let them walk, let them walk, let them walk. No, you've got a few. Yeah. Look, look at the Wait a minute, yeah, look at the yeah, ants. Mm. Right. Mm. And then, what do you think? Yum, mm. yum. You must make a noise. Mm. Mm. Better with Branston pickle, eh? Mm. Yes, actually. <laughs> we are visiting the market in the centre of St George's, Grenada. Kite surfing at Union Island in the St Vincent group of the Grenadines. This is Tobago Keys, one of the premier cruising targets of the world. And how many boats are here, Louise? 27. Thank you. Left pretty much on time. This is the ferry leaving Beckwe and heading for Kingston in the St. Vincent Island. And this is the street scene in Kingston, where people are selling these uh, ripped off DVDs, plus anything else you may care to buy. As we head for Rodney Bay in St Lucia, we are passing the Petons, an active volcanic group at the south end of the island. It has a very... Yeah. Nice feel. Really? Yeah. This is Louise with a pork constrictor in St. Lucia. That's Belongs to this idea. gentleman here. <laughs> there you go, this is the savannah in the centre of Fort de France. And of course, the famous statue here is one of Josephine, the consort of Napoleon, who lost her head. At least the statue did. And in fact, Edith and I were here in the 60s, I think as early as 63, and she had no head then either, so the head has been long gone. These are the remains of the old prison where a guy called Cypress survived the actual eruption because he was in a deep, dark cell somewhere. That's actually the entrance to the dungeon that Mr. Cy Paris survived the eruption in. So it is pretty substantial and it faced away from the volcano which was one reason the gases didn't quite make it to burn him to death. And this is what he lived in. This is the town of Plymouth on Montserrat. It was overwhelmed by Soufria in 95. You can see just behind that sailboat there are still some houses standing but they've all been abandoned. And also you can see there that it's smoking. You can see the smoke there, it certainly smells of hydrogen sulfide. Before we got to Nevis, I was contacted via email by a retired surgeon who lives there, Desmond. He and his wife, Catherine, were very, very kind to us while we were there. And here's the crew and myself having lunch with them. There's the crew at Fox's famous bar on Jos van Dijk. Here it is. And there's every chance that we'll help ourselves to a rum punch in a few minutes. That's the bar, and behind me here is the dinghy dock. There. In Puerto Rico, we toured El Yonke National Forest, and this is El Coco Falls. This is the conclusion of the leg from Puerto Rico to Bermuda. We're entering the town cut at St. George's. On board are George and Peg who were crew from Puerto Rico to Bermuda. Mm. 
Well, that's a unique wind vane. Colin and Gabby are going to ascend the model, the replica of the Deliverance. Welcome to the Deliverance, a ship that saved our American colony at Jamestown. I am William Strakey, secretary to the Virginia settlement and survivor of the Sea Venture Wreck. What an ordeal we have endured. Ten months stranded on the Bermudas, building this vessel to make our escape. Crystal cave in Bermuda. Here. On the ceiling instead, so um, be This is Tobacco Bay, St. George's. Really beautiful spot. And the girls are trying to attract some fish with breadcrumbs. Look at all the fish! Oh, you found them? Yeah, we did. This is fun. What do you think, Gabriella? I like it. <laughs> Good. Good. Oh, yeah, we're going to, to light it together. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Good. Okay, here we go. Thank you. We are leaving Bermuda uh, on uh, Saturday, the 21st. Here's our new crew member here, John, who's a veteran of a Transatlantic rowing match and uh, saying goodbye to St. George's. Lovely day, but there's a lot of heavy weather ahead. And there is uh, Bob, the new crew right. member, too. Here's Eric, the picture of Bob. The picture of Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the Picton Castle heading for St. George's. The boat we've seen many times in Lunenburg, actually. During the five-day trip from Bermuda to Fire Island Inlet on Long Island, we experienced every kind of weather from calms to gales and here we are battling a 25 knot wind on the port bow. We are back at Weeks' yard at the end of a 10-month trip, 12,500 miles. There's uh, John who crewed up from Bermuda and we've got all the flags of the countries we visited. Which, there we are, Weeks' Yard, April 27, 2012.